I recently picked up this Chinese made laser tattoo removal device from eBay. Now according to the specs, this thing should contain a really scary pulse laser system inside, and if so I'd love to screw around with it. When it comes to wacky eBay gadgets like this, you never know what you're going to get. For one, sellers often blatantly lie about the ratings. And two, this entire system costs less than having a doctor burn off a tattoo, so it's not like you can expect some state-of-the-art medical system. Now that being said, I'm not super concerned with how safe or effective this thing is, because honestly, I just want to blow some stuff out with a pulse laser. In fact, if this thing can produce pulses of, say, oh, I don't know, like a million watts, I'll be pretty impressed. If not, I'll just have to give it some much-needed upgrades. So yeah, without further ado, let's fire this thing up. So, uh, spoiler alert, this thing packs some serious firepower. See all those little marks in the screen? This thing is so powerful that it blew a bunch of holes in my camera's sensor without even taking a direct hit. Now what I'm getting at is that this thing definitely isn't a toy. And as tempting as it may be, I do not recommend buying one of these things. Dangerous is an understatement for this laser. And if you don't have some high-end laser goggles, you'll go blind using this thing. So yeah, please don't try anything you see in this video at home. Alright, so here's what all came with this unit. So you got the laser head here and the main power supply. Uh, you got these uh, treatment specific tips that actually might be able to change the laser's output color. Uh, you got this, uh, this really mysterious ointment, uh, this funnel for adding cooling water, a uh, foot switch, and then these, uh, these really sketchy laser goggles. This manual here, if you could even call it that, turned out to be completely useless for assembling this thing. But luckily putting this thing together was really straightforward. Like honestly a 10 year old could assemble this thing. I'm not totally sure that's a good thing. I went ahead and used uh, deionized water for the coolant fluid because it turns out that ultra pure water is actually a really really good electrical insulator. Pretty cool, right? Now before I power up the laser, I need something to protect my eyeballs because from what I hear, permanent blindness is a bummer. Now the hilarious thing is that the goggles that came with this unit are the complete opposite color of my own goggles that are rated for a YAG laser like this. Now I don't know about you guys, but I feel like this could be a huge issue, so I'm going to play it safe by wearing these things. Now unfortunately I don't have any uh, visible tattoos that I can burn off for this video, but luckily this is an all-in-one device. You can also uh, remove eyebrows, remove birthmarks, uh, freckle, and then uh, whatever black doll is. My eyebrows probably could use a little bit of taming, but you know what, before I start pointing this thing at my face, I better test it on something like uh, this piece of metal over here. Alright, I got the energy maxed out, here we go. Oh my gosh, that is loud. It's literally blowing craters in the metal. That is a lot of damage. Check out those insane plasma fireballs. The surface must be getting incredibly hot. I was not expecting this thing to be so strong, especially out of the box. Like that's just blowing craters into metal with nothing but light. Like, that's insane! This thing packs some serious power. Right here I have a two and a half kilo chunk of tungsten. Let's see what happens when I hit it with the laser. In case you don't find these little craters impressive, tungsten has a melting point of over 3,400 degrees Celsius, the highest melting point of all pure metals. Now, I wouldn't even be surprised if the center of the fireball is hotter than the surface of the sun. I know what you're thinking. What happens if you get hit by the beam? Well, one way to find out, I guess. Oh wow, it kind of tickles. Well, I mean, yeah, it hurts, but not nearly as bad as I was expecting. That's actually pretty neat. Now, the reason it's not leaving craters in my skin is the fact that my skin just doesn't absorb this light very well. Now this is especially useful for removing dark tattoos, as the laser selectively destroys the dark ink while leaving the skin untouched. Well, sort of. As an example of this, let's pretend I've made the biggest mistake of my entire life, and the only way for my family to love me again is to get it burned off. Well, lucky for me, this is just another day at the office for this laser. Well that sucked. I mean yeah, it erased the ink. It actually did a really good job. But maybe maxing out the power wasn't the best idea here. Eh, whatever. My skin will probably heal. Now unfortunately, burning off a tattoo isn't always so simple. Uh, for one, my pale skin and dark ink make selectively destroying the ink a lot easier. But the thing is, lasers are racist. 
I mean, those with a darker complexion are a lot more likely to receive burns, just because their skin absorbs more of the light. And that isn't even the only complicating factor. I mean, tattoos come in a huge variety of different colors, so you can't use just one laser for all of them. As an extreme example of this, I've tattooed these two boards here. Now when I try to remove the one on the darker board, it's hard to prevent destroying the surface along with the ink. But even on the lighter board, I run into issues. Now the dark ink comes off pretty easily, but the red ink is essentially untouched. So now what do we do? That's where this witchcraft comes in. So inside this tip is a crystal of potassium titanophosphate, or KTP for short. It splices two IR photons together to make one green photon via a process called second harmonic generation. Now the fact that you can just screw this onto the tip to make it green is literally insane, because it's usually a lot harder to pull off nonlinear optical processes like this. The green light does a much better job at removing the red ink, but really this isn't much of a surprise since red and green are on opposite sides of the color wheel. Okay, so it works on wood, but how about skin? Ugh, one way to find out. Oh, holy heck, that hurt. It turns out a lot of things absorb the green light better, and that includes my skin. So sorry guys, but I'm gonna have to pass on lasering this one off. I guess it's permanent now. Oh yeah, rubbing alcohol's a thing, isn't it? So what else can I do with the green beam? Well, how about cleaning some dirty coins? Oh wow, look at that, good as new. The polka dots give it an added touch. Don't you hate it when your transformers get all rusty? Well, luckily with this laser, you can burn the rust right off. Oh wow, that's amazing! I don't even need to use corrosive chemicals. Just an unimaginably dangerous laser. Aluminum foil reflects all but just a few percent of the light that hits it. So is it possible that we can shoot through it anyway? I guess so. Now well, that's actually pretty crazy, because remember, that's just light that's shooting through the foil. Now if we look at it in slow motion, you can see little pieces of burning aluminum flying off of the metal. That's actually pretty neat. Oh yeah, see all those little spots in the picture? This is when I noticed them too. Ah, f heck. Turns out that even without a direct hit, the laser still managed to blast a bunch of holes in the camera sensor. And since there's no fixing that, I might as well keep lasering stuff until the entire sensor goes blind. This one was suggested to me by YouTube user Viduli, and it's just a block of clear acrylic. Now even though it's nearly transparent, the laser can still burn its entire beam path into the plastic. Now it's funny because I tried using this effect to engrave stuff into the acrylic, I just ended up vaporizing the surface of my table behind the block. A balloon seems like a silly test compared to everything else, but check this out. Well, that was surprisingly difficult, what gives? It turns out that the hot plasma formed on the surface ends up absorbing most of the laser pulse energy, and this actually protects the material behind it somewhat. This is why military laser weapons are almost never pulsed. When it comes to burning stuff with a powerful laser, it's hard to find something easier to set on fire than a match. But this is a pulse laser, so it doesn't behave like you'd expect. In fact, the laser obliterates match heads without even igniting them. I think the explosions at the surface must be too violent to allow a stable flame to form. Hmm, I wonder if this laser can burn a CD. Oh yeah, it punches straight through it. Even if I flip it to the shiny side, it still vaporizes the metal coating. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Oh yeah, I can't forget about these goggles that were sent with the kit. Now surely the sellers care about our safety, right? Ha! Huh, look at that! Yeah, that's right. Your retinas would look like a slice of Swiss cheese if you trusted these things. Big oof to those who bought one of these kits and used the included goggles. Look what happens if I don't point it at anything. Oh yeah, the air ignites. Think about just how crazy that is. Air, which is basically transparent, is exploding in the laser beam. If you want to light the air on fire with nothing but light, you need some gigantic power densities. In fact, the threshold is something like 300 billion watts per square centimeter. Now that gives us a lower bound in power density, but what's that say about actual output power? The seller claims that this laser outputs a max of 2 joules in each 10 nanosecond pulse. Now 2 joules may not seem like a lot of energy, but when that's dumped in just 10 nanoseconds, you're talking a peak power of 200 million watts. But let's just pretend like the seller's a total liar. How do we measure the output power ourselves? 
Well, it's not as easy as just pointing it at a meter, because it turns out that most sensors just don't like eating megawatt class laser pulses. But that being said, we can get a pretty good estimation using just a tiny bit of math. Calculating actual power from the power density means that we need to find the minimum size that the laser can focus down to. Now this is difficult for me to measure directly. We can use the fact that lasers tend to take on a Gaussian beam profile in order to make some estimations. In the simplest case, you have a wave traveling along Z and polarized along X that takes on the fundamental transverse mode of the laser resonator. Now when this happens, the uh, time independent electromagnetic field looks approximately like this. Now if you're thinking, oh wow, I'd rather stab my eyeballs out than try working with that, well you're not alone. But it actually turns out that the special mathematical properties of the Gaussian function uh, mean that these beams can be described with just a few simple parameters, and then manipulated with simple algebra. I started by measuring the beam divergence, and then calculated the waist radius using the laser's wavelength, and this gives a diameter of approximately 10 microns. Now equating a beam of this size to the minimum radiance required to ionize air gives a minimum laser output power of 150,000 watts. But the thing is, there's no way that this thing is operating even close to the perfect Gaussian beam. So if it's, say, 10 times worse with a 100 micron beam diameter, well, that gives an output power of 15 million watts. And now this seems crazy, and it's actually several times higher than the instantaneous electrical power draw of the entire town that I live in, but it is actually reasonable. Alright, so I have a pulse laser with output in the megawatts. Now blowing stuff up is always going to be fun, but what else can I do with it? Well, how about using it to build a laser-pumped laser? There's a lot of ways to pull off laser inception by using one laser to drive another. But today I'm feeling old school, and I also want to play with some chemicals. Here I have an assortment of organic dyes, some that I synthesized years ago, and others that I bought online. Now under the right conditions, these dyes can be used as a laser medium that can output a huge variety of colors. Oh wow, this brings me back to my time in academia. Well, this does at least. I'm not exactly throwing a party though. I just need to make some solutions of these dyes in ethanol. These dyes are extremely photoactive, so a little goes a long way here. In fact, I only need something like 50 milligrams per 100 milliliters of solvent. And even this may be too much, so I'll probably end up diluting them. Now a precise concentration isn't super important, but too much dye in the solution will kill the output. I started by filling a cuvette with rhodamine B dye solution diluted to about 10% of the original. Now placing the cuvette directly in the beam path does give some colorful light, but I can't be sure that this is actual laser emission. By kicking the cuvette off at an angle, the green laser beam is refracted through the cuvette so that it doesn't line up directly with the potential dye laser beam. Now sure enough, this reveals that the liquid is actually operating as its own laser, and there's now an orange beam exiting at an angle to the original pump green beam. Now that is pretty cool. Since there's still so much green light left exiting the cuvette, I up the concentration to utilize more of the pump light, and this actually dramatically increases the output. Now I found the best results using about a half a millimolar of rhodamine B. Now notice that I'm not using any sort of external mirrors to act as an optical resonator. In fact, the roughly 10% reflectivity of the cuvette walls provides enough feedback to achieve a massive amount of optical amplification. Now that's a material that likes to laze. Since the reflectivity is the same on all sides of the cuvette, you get laser emission from each side of the cell, with one face typically favored stronger than the others. Now of interesting note is the presence of these side beams running 45 degrees to the main beams. Now it turns out that the corners of this square cell act as strong enough retroreflectors to form laser cavities here too, thus forming this beautiful but terrifying laser star of insta-blindness. Sticking a mirror on one end causes the majority of the dye laser output to exit in the opposite direction, giving some sort of controllability. Still though, I wasn't comfortable viewing the output in person as the peak power is still very high, and my goggles don't even block this color. Now this is a real bummer too because orange lasers are very hard to come by. In terms of peak output power, this laser tattoo removal system is actually the most powerful laser that I've shown on this channel. So what exactly is inside this beast? I tore down the main unit to see what's inside. It's actually pretty simple. So you have some control circuitry over there, uh, you got a water pump and water cooling reservoir, a uh, switching high voltage power supply, then an energy storage capacitor right here which supplies energy to the uh, pulse laser. Now notice there aren't any optics in here. In fact the entire laser cavity is contained within the handle. Tearing this down reveals that the laser inside is old school. It's actually quite similar to the first laser ever built. There's a flash lamp here that pumps light into a crystal of neodymium doped yttrium aluminum garnet, or NDYAG for short. This energizes the neodymium ions in the crystal, and sitting between these two mirrors here allows it to operate as a laser. Now as a side note, NDYAG was one of the first laser media ever discovered, and it's still widely used today, so it's actually pretty cool that it survived the test of time like this. There's a special optic that's added to the cavity here which allows it to produce such absurd pulse powers. Now initially it absorbs the light coming from the crystal, which actually kills the laser output. But what this does is it allows the crystal to build up a bunch of energy while the flashlamp fires. 
but after the optic absorbs enough light, it suddenly becomes transparent, effectively exposing the highly energized crystal to the cavity mirrors. Now this causes all that energy to get dumped in an incredibly short amount of time, limited by the time it takes for the light to make a few bounces through the cavity. Now this process is called Q-switching, and doing it passively with this little optic is probably the simplest method in use. When this Q-switch laser fires, pulses have a duration of about 10 billionths of a second, which means that light only travels about 3 meters during this time. To put that in perspective, putting a laser pointer in the sky for one second will produce a pulse that is 300,000 kilometers long. It's really hard to fathom timescales this tiny, but amazingly there are already lasers that run over 10 million times faster than this. So now that I've gone through the trouble of tearing it apart, is there anything I can do to make it stronger? Well, removing the Q-switch would actually increase the energy a bit, but that's at the cost of a dramatically decreased peak power. In fact, if I want to increase the output, my best bet is to feed more energy to the lamp. Looking at the energy storage capacitor, I see that it's rated for 1400 volts at 100 microfarads. When I actually measure the live voltage through a voltage divider, I see that it only gets charged to a max of about 800 volts, or only about a third of the energy that it's rated for. As a side note, Using this measurement as a way to estimate peak power actually gives a similar result to the one I got earlier, but this time I get about 30 million watts. For funsies, I use this number to calculate the strength of the electromagnetic field at the beam waist, and as expected, it's insane! Look at that, an electric field of over a billion volts per meter. That's hundreds of times stronger than what the accelerators produce in the Large Hadron Collider. Now granted, that's over a tiny distance, but still shows the potential of lasers and desktop particle accelerators. Alright, so back to modding this thing. So I guess I have two main options here to increase the output. I could crank up the voltage feeding the capacitor, but since the impedance of the flash lamp is non-linear, a higher voltage would mean a shorter pulse length and that would disproportionately overpower the flash lamp. My guess is that charging the cap up to its full rating would annihilate the lamp in one shot. So I guess my other option is to add more capacitors, as this will definitely increase the energy and will be done more gently over a longer pulse. I went ahead and added enough capacitors to triple the energy in the circuit. So without further ado, let's test this thing out. All right, here we go. Um, that was bad. Did it just heck break? Yep, it broke. It turns out that some underpaid grad students in the 60s came up with these empirical equations that describe the lifetime of a flash lamp with its drive energy. In fact, there's a dramatic relationship here, to the power of eight and a half, actually. That means that tripling the drive energy for a given pulsing will actually destroy the lamp about 11,000 times faster than running in at its original energy, so it's no wonder that the lamp exploded. As a side note, pretty much all of the laser science in this video can be found in this book from 1976. I learned a bunch from it when I first read it four years ago, and the info is still just as relevant today. Now for those out there who are interested in experimenting with old school flash lamp pump lasers, you'd be hard pressed to find a better resource than this. Well, I hate to have such an anticlimactic ending, but I think I've destroyed enough of my equipment for one video. But seriously, I obliterated the Sony camera that I just bought last year, and I even put a few more holes in this camera that I'm shooting with right now. Now, including the tattoo laser that I destroyed, this was by far my most expensive video yet. Now, luckily, I have some dedicated Patreon supporters that have kept supporting me even when I can't upload very frequently. Now, as a thank you to you guys, I'm going to let you guys see this video first before I make it public anywhere else. So yeah, big thank you to you guys. One last thing. So even when I'm not uploading to my channel, I'm usually posting content to my other social media, so be sure to check those pages out via the links in the description. I especially recommend watching the most recent vid on my backup channel of an amazing lightning storm I experienced while tornado chasing. Plus, to all the makers and home experimenters out there, I highly recommend checking out my Discord server, as there's a ton of knowledgeable members there, and they're always working on awesome projects. So yeah, until the next time, stay safe and happy lazing!